are Locked On Rays, your daily Tampa Bay Rays podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Rays podcast and Ulysses. Today we have a very special guest, and that is one of the Rays' top prospects, depending on which outlet you look at. He may be the number one prospect, may be the number two prospect. Regardless, he is uh, on a tear and, and fast rising throughout the baseball world. Curtis Mead. Curtis, thank you for joining us. And first off, how do you stay grounded amid all the, the articles and uh, podcast and blog posts that where your name just keeps popping up. How do you stay grounded through all that? Yeah, it definitely gets challenging at times. Um, you know, I definitely don't try and read too much into it because um, I don't want to get in that habit if I start not playing as well because then people might not have as as nice things to say. So just kind of look at bits and pieces. But, yeah, it's it's pretty cool and special. But, you know, there's plenty of work still to be done. So. When when you hear the noise and you try to kind of, you know, not, you know, stick your head into it too much. Um, who are the people around you that that can still kind of give you crap and, and know you before you are a, a top prospect? Like, uh, who are the, those people that, that are keeping you grounded right now? Yeah, definitely a lot of people from home. So I went home this past off season, spent, you know, end of October to probably just two weeks ago. Um, back in Australia, and, you know, I'm still the same guy. Last time I was home, I was still playing in the GCL. You know, I was with the Phillies, and I was a, a rookie ball player, no no prospect status or nothing. So they definitely still give me a hard time, and, you know, I'm still still the same person back there, so it's cool to go home. That's great. What kind of fun stuff did you get to do in Australia that, that you hadn't done in a while? Uh, I played a lot of golf, caught up with a lot of different people, um, took my girlfriend home and we went traveling a bit. So saw, actually saw some different parts of Australia that I hadn't seen before, you know, some of the more touristy parts. So yeah, we had a really good time. So it was, it was really refreshing. Very cool. Is, is baseball since you returned back to Australia, is it gaining a little bit more traction and in popularity back in Australia? I mean, since you've kind of become more of a, a public figure in the sport. Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely getting bigger, you know, and I think uh, some people in South Australia and Australia have kind of taken to my career and really enjoy watching. And, you know, it's pretty special being around. You know, it's funny, like in everyday world, like in Australia, people have no idea about baseball. But then when I do go to baseball events and stuff, um, just talking to some people, meeting some fans and stuff, it's yeah, it's really cool. And I think people are really starting to get behind the game and enjoy watching. You know, we're, we're talking about baseball, Australia. Obviously, the elephant in the room is that the World Baseball Classic is coming up. You know, I, I'm, I'm a big World Baseball Classic guy that the rosters for Venezuela were, were released. So I went completely fanboy, uh, obviously. But your name was not on the Australian roster. Um, can you talk about, you know, how difficult that decision was between you, the Rays, your family, your agent? And, uh, you know, obviously, you've represented Australia in the past, but... How difficult was that back and forth between you and the team? Yeah, you know, it was definitely not a decision uh, that I necessarily enjoyed. You know, I really wanted to play for Australia and represent my country and play with some of my really good friends. Um, you know, but it was just really bad timing for me in terms of the injury. My arm, it does feel awesome. I'm really happy with where I'm at, but uh, the Tampa medical staff felt like the best thing for my career was to play my first games um, in early March in St. Petersburg with the race, as opposed to traveling to Japan and playing. So, you know, that, uh, that was disappointing, but hopefully in the long run, it's the best for my career. And hopefully there's other opportunities to represent Australia. And I really look forward to them. There should be plenty, you know, if, if it's in four years, you'll, you'll be practically in your prime at 26. So that, that should, that should be really fun. Now you, you did talk about the, the elbow injury. Can you, Kind of tell race fans about how that elbow injury happened, what the rehab process has looks like um, since since you got hurt, and you know how how ready are you for spring training day number one? Yeah, so unfortunately, at the end of last year, um, kind of in the June July period, I really what just happened was a bunch of overworking. So right after the All Star break, you know, my elbow experienced some. Um, 
uh, soreness just after a lot of throwing, um, after one big big weekend of throwing. Uh, got an MRI, realized there was a, a partial tear in my UCL, which wasn't the best news. Uh, tried to rehab it without doing anything and, and just giving it some time. It didn't necessarily work. So then we uh, opted for a PRP injection. Um, took three months off, you know, it was kind of a long three months, not really doing anything, but then I got an MRI at the end of December and I was, uh, clear. So I had no more tear in my UCL had fully healed. Um, and then started the build up process, uh, in January, started throwing in the first of January. Um, and now I'm back out to about 150 feet pain free. So I feel really good. And I feel like when the games start rolling around, I'll be ready to roll. So I'm yeah, really pleased with how everything's going. Perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor, and you obviously know more about this, but UCL, partially torn, this sounds a lot like Tommy John, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, it's definitely scary. I mean, I luckily it was such a small tear that I had, I'd seen a few doctors and no one had really ever told me to get surgery. Um, okay. So it was something that I, we always felt like we could avoid in terms of just not throwing and get the PRP injection and rest would do it good and before I I started throwing uh, after just resting, and I was out to about 120 feet before I felt it again. So I was was pretty close. I felt like, and then I felt with the injection just to help help with the healing process and more time off. I I did feel pretty confident that I was gonna you know get back healthy. So pretty pleased with how it's going. Yeah, and speaking on that injury, Curtis, just what was the challenge of that for you mentally of of basically being taken off the baseball field and, and being limited and not being able to continue uh, your career, just sort of a, a stoppage in play, if you will, not being able to, to go out to the diamond every day with, with your teammates. Yeah. You know, it's super challenging. Uh, fortunately, I was actually able to stay in Durham with the team in AAA. So that was nice, but at the same time, even more challenging, you know, seeing the team that I would be playing on uh, competing, having success and ultimately winning the championship. So it was kind of bittersweet, you know, I would have loved to have been out there for the guys, but obviously super happy for them all. Um, so, yeah, it definitely was a tough period. Then to, then to go home to Australia and, you know, I just had to completely hit the reset button. I wasn't able to throw, hit, do anything, play golf, nothing. So I just kind of decided I was going to work hard in the gym and take it easy um, physically. Um, but, yeah, I'm really happy how, with how it's worked out and pleased that I had the patience to uh, to do not much. So. How does how does that transition work? Where now now you can't you're you're in the clubhouse. That's awesome with the guys in the dugout. Obviously, it hurts. But how, do you start like going over more video? Do you go over more stats? I mean, how 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 do you transition from you know doing your baseball related activities to just kind of like you know what do you do with your hands? Like what do you do to spend the time? Yeah, so I actually got with. Uh, one of the running coaches, uh, our strength and conditioning coach, you know, and they had told me that much, much to my, you know, I didn't enjoy it, but they said I could run as much as I wanted. Um, <laughs> so I spent a lot of time running and trying to get a little bit quicker. Um, when probably about a month, uh, uh, the month before the PRP injection, I worked on my hitting um, with a few of the hitting coaches there just to kind of, tidy up a few things that I felt like I'd been uh, struggling a little bit with, with my transition to AAA. Um, but yeah, not much really, just kind of listening to people, uh, asking questions. Uh, yeah, not a ton. <laughs> it was challenging. Yeah. And you mentioned running. Um, do you feel like you're faster through all that experience? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I did some testing from when I got back to Australia and when I left and I got a little bit quicker. So I was pretty pleased with that. You know, there's definitely an aspect of my game. I could always continue to improve, become more agile and stuff is always, always a vital part of being an infielder. So yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. And obviously you, you were able to, despite the injuries, spend more time in Durham and a larger taste of AAA this season compared to the previous season. Um, just kind of having more of that experience now, what do you see as, as the biggest difference or challenge of going from double A AA to triple A? I, I don't know if it's the, the speed of the game, if the pitchers are bringing more velocity and, and pinpoint accuracy, just uh, that adjustment from double A AA to triple A for you. 
Uh, maybe a little bit of the speed of the game. You know, there's a little... Uh, the more you go up in the minor leagues, the more there is um, the enhancement on winning games. So there was definitely more of a, like everyone wanted to win. They were teaching us how to win. You know, we were playing to win pretty much. Um, so I think the biggest adjustment for me was uh, relievers. You know, big moments would come up. I'd come up with people on base and I would see, you know, high end quality right-handed relievers that I would ultimately face at the next level in the big leagues. So I I had to get used to facing the best guys in the biggest situations. So uh, that was definitely a learning curve and, you know, understanding how those guys are going to attack me and my weaknesses. Um, so that was probably the most challenging thing where most of the time in double A, the best pitchers are your top prospect starters in double A, not, not so much out of the bullpen. So... Yeah, the, the bullpen, you know, you'd see guys who you'd face who two nights ago they were in the big leagues pitching against the Rays or the Red Sox or whoever. So, you know, it was, right. that was pretty cool. We have more on this episode, but first we have to tell you something important, and that is FanDuel. Uh, the midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because new customers get a no sweat first bet for up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So, don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on, L O C K E D O N, to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA. Talking about that double A to triple A transition, I, I, I dove kind of uh, into the numbers uh, a little bit. There was a big jump. When you went from double A AA to triple A on your line drive percentage in double A, you were at 17.2%. And then in triple A, it clocked in at 40%. So was that something that was a conscious effort uh, that, that, that brought that about? What, what was the adjustment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I honestly, if you look at face value, I, my triple A numbers weren't maybe as good as double A, but then when you dig in a little deeper, you know, I felt like I had more success in triple A than I did in double A. Um, yeah. And I'm not, not totally sure. Uh, maybe working with high level coaches, uh, being in playing with high level players, there wasn't necessarily one adjustment that caused that. I think one of the big things too, is the umpiring was a little bit better. So, you know, maybe a pitch that might mm. end the at bat or change the at bat early in the at bat now goes your way. And, you know, I was getting better pitches to hit. So I definitely, my swing decisions were better in triple A and I think I was rewarded a little bit more for that. So. Yeah. And, and last time you were on, on, on the show, you talked about trying to just hit the ball hard and as much as you could to the center of the field. And again, when you look at the double A to triple A um, percentage points on, on your your pull percentage decreased by 11 points when you went to triple A, yeah. you're starting to hit way more to the center of the field by 14 points. So is this something that you also were trying to do or did it just happen because of all those external factors you just talked about? Yeah, I mean, it probably happened a little bit because of that, but uh, my approach hasn't really changed throughout the level. Um I do usually try to stay to the center of the field. I like to give myself room for error. Um, I like to spin the ball with backspin. So I'm trying to, you know, if I elevate to the center of the field, that usually results in backspin. Um, but yeah, there wasn't wasn't any any real adjustment there either. You know, probably swinging at better pitches, and when you do swing at better pitches, you put better swings on the ball. So, you know, yeah. Now, Curtis, kind of talking about your swing a little bit and, and your approach, um, you know, if somebody goes and looks up a YouTube video of you, they'll see that your stance is very upright and tall. Um, where did that come from uh, initially? And, and why does that approach work for you, that style work for you? Uh, I'm not totally sure. You know, from a young age, I always feel 
more comfortable being tall and adjusting down as opposed to being, you know, I'd always struggled maybe with a higher pitch. So I'd always like to be as tall as possible to give myself the best chance up there. And I'd always kind of hit really well uh, at pitches down in the zone. Um, so, yeah, it's just what's what's always felt comfortable. You know, I've, I've always kind of had like a short, narrow stance as well. Um, but, yeah, it's just something I've done from a young age that my dad probably really taught me, you know. So it's just kind of stuck and it's how I feel the most comfortable. And when things aren't going right, I kind of default back to that if I've slowly crept away from it. So, yeah. If, if a Rays fan were to see a video of you, Curtis, in like grainy, you know, type of like, O2, like before high definition started, yeah. they might think that's Longo at the plate with his upright uh, stance. Ha has have people talked to you uh, about how that resemblance uh, uh, has kind of uh, happened? Yeah, definitely. You know, I've heard that a few times. Um, and I'm really honored to be put in the same conversation as Evan. Um, so yeah, that would be a pretty cool turnout if I turned out like him. So not not. <laughs> Apparently, from a young age, I copied him, but you know, it's definitely someone I watch now, having a lot of similarities. So, yeah, yeah, I, th I think race fans would, would would love that. Um, you know, the you talked about being a traditional stats guy, and that you were kind of making the the transition to being a little bit more an analytical and looking at other type of of stats. How is uh, that transition going for you? Are, are are you are you a little bit more comfortable with with some of the new age type of stats. Uh, how are you grading yourself with this, these new stats? Yeah, no, it's definitely something I've continued to get better at and more comfortable with. Uh, lots of the hitting coordinators, when they come into town, you know, they'll break it down with us. And the, the, the batting average, the slugging percentage or what, are, none of that will even be on the page. You know, it's kind of really in-depth now. Um, and it makes me feel more comfortable, you know, as I said, earlier my triple a numbers in terms of those stats were better but you know if you looked at face value and double you think i was doing better um so it definitely helps you know i didn't wasn't hitting 300 in triple a but i was my expected numbers were a lot better so it makes you feel a little bit better about yourself and you know not not hitting the panic button and changing things when everything's actually doing pretty good so yeah following up on that what are some of those stats that coaches and front office types are, are giving the players first like these are the the top three four five stats that you should be looking at or that they're giving to you as a hitter uh probably the main one that they look at well main two is woba so weighted on base percentage okay uh, uh weighted on base average sorry um and expected woba so then you've got an expected number as opposed to so in AAA, my expected numbers were way higher than what my actual numbers were. So talking about being unlucky. Um, mm -hmm. And then weighted runs created WRC plus and expected WRC plus. So those two are the, probably the big ones. Are there any type of graphs with this information? Is is there video work associated with, with this information? Or is it just, hey, look, at these are the stats and they kind of go through those stats with you guys? Uh, kind of just go through them. I mean, it's hard to put them into video per se. So it's kind of with with at least WIC plus the, the league average is 100. So it's very league based. So, you know, if it's 120, you're 20% better than the league average. So it's kind of a good reflection of where you're at, at in comparison to the rest of the league. So Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I, I was looking at, I was trying to find a little bit more information on the defensive end uh, uh, of your of your of your work, but with minor league numbers, it's it's not that readily available. Yeah. Uh, I, I see that in 2022, you've played first, second, third. Can you give us a breakdown on which positions, how comfortable you feel at each of those positions, and if you were to rank them, which one do you enjoy playing the most to the least? Yeah, so it's funny, and actually in terms of comfort level is also in terms of how I think I bring the most value. So I definitely feel the most comfortable at third um, because of the last two, three years I'd spent majority of my time there. You know, I feel like I catch the ball really well. You know, my arm isn't one of my strong suits, but I feel like it's adequate enough to be good. And I have a pretty good internal clock. So I know when I need to throw given my arm strength in comparison to, you know, Manny Machado. Um, Second, I would put 
second base. I feel pretty good there. I played that a lot as a junior and now coming back to that. This year was initially a challenge, um, but yeah, spending, I would spend two, three games a week there. And I, you know, I really started to enjoy it and understood the footwork and that sort of thing. And I, I started to get a lot better. Um, and then last would be first, but mainly just because I haven't played it as much as the other two. You know, I still feel like I could be adequate enough. And if I am going to spend some time there in the future, I'm more than happy to. And I would just like to put a lot of effort in. You know, if they had told me at spring training, hey, we want you to play first this year, I would work super hard and make sure that I was the most valuable defensive first baseman I could be. Curtis, in an ideal scenario, um, as a minor leaguer and then hopefully relatively soon getting to the majors, would you prefer to have one position like, hey, I'm going to be a, a third baseman full time? Or do you like this um, opportunity to to move around a little bit and, and get that versatility to your resume and, and try something else? Or I, there's also got to be the challenge of you're, you're learning new positions as you're trying to grow and develop as a hitter and, and as a player overall too. Yeah, I definitely enjoy the versatility. You know, I, I, I do enjoy moving around. I enjoy taking ground balls at different spots. Um, and I know that in the long run, you know, it's going to give me more opportunities. The more positions I can play, the more um, attractive I am to the coaching staff and to other teams and whoever. Uh, so I do enjoy being versatile and, you know, I, I just want to be in the lineup. That's the goal is I want to play wherever I can so I can hit and have fun. So, yeah. <laughs> um, like Kevin just said, uh, hopefully a, 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 a major league, uh, leaguer very soon. Obviously, you know, that the, 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 the time is, is, is ticking. It's very close for you to, to happen. What, what are your thoughts when when you think about spring training and and what you have to work on to to have that dream become a reality very soon? What are you working on to do that? Uh, I think honestly, the first part of spring training would just be getting familiar again. You know, I've taken probably six seven months off playing, um, so just getting my feet wet, getting more comfortable playing at that level, uh, get more comfortable with the guys in the locker room uh seeing that type of pitching you know i've faced a lot of big league arms but just being comfortable facing them again getting some confidence um and then i think just cleaning up a few things defensively to make sure that i feel like i'm an above average defender wherever i play in the big leagues um so yeah i think a big big part of it to start with will being comfortable and being comfortable having conversations with the coaching staff the other players um, and that sort of thing. So yeah, I'm re really looking forward to going down. Yeah, that's a really good point you made. Obviously, on the field improvements, but off the field as well. Just wanted to gauge you on this. Just in your experience with the Rays, who do you have that closest relationship with, um, player and or coach? Just who are those couple of guys that that you lean on consistently? Uh, probably the biggest one is Brandon, Brandon Loud, just because we're from the same agency. So uh, we hit together, you know, in the 2021 off season where I was here the whole year, we hit together pretty much every day. Um, so I kind of think of him a little bit as a big brother. You know, he gives me a hard time. I give him a hard time. But <laughs> I think we've both got our best interests for each other. So he's probably someone that I will have leaned on and will continue to do. You know, I ask him a few questions about some of the other guys, the coaches and just about logistics in general. But yeah, he would, he would probably be the main guy that I would look towards in the big league team. That's great to hear. And, and following up on that, what kind of advice or what sort of things has he told you about taking that next step and in, in being a big leaguer, maybe just some of, you know, some things to, to keep an eye on at, uh, keep an eye on and, and watch out for just general advice he's given you. Yeah, you know, he, we've we've kind of gone through it all, whether it be relationships with the clubhouse, you know, obviously being the young guy is challenging. Uh, mm -hmm. So just how, how I guess he's given me advice on like how some young guys have come in and rubbed some of the older guys the wrong way a little bit. Um, so just a few things to stick clear of. Um, and then also from a performance wise, you know, how to prepare each day. Uh, just a few things with the travel, 
uh, how to stay ready and get ready all the time. We've talked about pinch hitting, you know, because that could be a role for me early on. Um, so, yeah, he's kind of – he's been really good. I'm, he's probably annoyed with me <laughs> with how many questions I ask him, but I just want to, you know, feel prepared as possible. Well, for me of, you know, young players coming into a clubhouse and maybe – being a little bit of a disruption or the the old guard just not really being as receptive and warm to them. But it's funny because, Curtis, when you were in the ABL, you know, several years ago, were you not, you know, one of the youngest players in that league where guys were, you know, seven, eight, nine years older than you? So maybe that gives you a little bit of a, an advantage of how to navigate a clubhouse like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have a few things going for me, you know, being unique. Um, with the Australian accent and that sort of thing. So that kind of sparks a, a conversation and a smile maybe every now and again from the American guys. So, uh, but yeah, no, definitely was fortunate with the ABL. You know, I played, been around a lot of older heads that have played in the big leagues and, you know, continue to play in the big leagues. Um, and I think I'm fortunate with the Rays. You know, Brandon speaks really highly of all the players in the clubhouse. So I think, um, I'm looking forward to getting closer with a lot of those guys. And, you know, that we don't really have uh, as big a personalities, it seems like, you know, being a smaller market team and, you know, some really super talented players that probably don't get the recognition um, that they deserve, but definitely some some not as big personalities, I think. So looking forward to it. I think you've described basically Brendan Lau, a guy who's always underrated. Uh, he's a tremendous uh, talent. And and I, I'm, Kevin, I'm just imagining uh, uh, Brendan Lau and Curtis Mead back to back in the lineup. And that, that would uh, be that yeah. would be a pretty sweet thing to, to watch in 2023. It it really would be Curtis. You need to you need to develop and, and get to the bigs because the the Rays need some help offensively. So and and I think uh, quite possibly you you could be the answer to that. Uh, which I guess is sort of another question that we have is, um, do you ever feel any pressure? I mean, you are you know depending on which outlet you look at, you're the number one number two prospect. Um, does that pressure ever get to you, or you just kind of you know focus on on your own game and just try to do the best you can? Yeah, it's it's funny. A few people have kind of asked me that over the last kind of six or twelve months, and you know, the more the more I continue to play well and hadn't have fun, I think the less the pressure goes away. Um, you know, I think ever, even from the start with the Phillies, I kind of put no expectations on myself. I was this young seventeen year old who'd only really been taking baseball seriously for two years. Uh, you know, I thought I, I thought I could play, but I had no idea really what I could achieve. And I still think that I haven't really put a cap on myself from a performance standpoint because I don't really know. And I think I continue to get better and I continue to enjoy the game more and work harder. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't really have expectations for myself. And I think because I don't put put a standard that I expect to be at, that I continue to kind of probably exceed what I what I would put those standards at so yeah no it's been awesome I mean I haven't really ever really felt the pressure um just enjoying the game and enjoying working hard and then you have the added wrinkle of you know setting the stage for your entire country I mean the the entire country of Australia is kind of leaning on you as well because there's not many uh not many Australian professionals let it, let alone hitters I mean we know about Grant Balfour and Liam Hendricks but you you can kind of be that that set the standard for for an entire country which is pretty cool as well I would assume yeah no that would be really special you know we've had a lot of high quality arms come out of Australia um and some bats too, obviously. Um, but it would be pretty cool to be, you know, I just think back home about people, you know, they turn on the race game every day and I'm out there every single day and they get to watch me. Um, and the amount of people that I knew supported me, but had a really, uh, a ton of really nice things to say about me when I was leaving and, you know, that they wake up and watch me in the minor leagues most days is, is pretty cool uh, to think about the support that I'm getting and the really nice messages. So, yeah, it is awesome. Um, but um, yeah, super honored to be to be at the front of it. Well, believe it or not, uh, but of course you're going to believe it because it is true. Uh, <laughs> when we look at our analytics for this podcast, this the obviously the number one market is the U.S., but yeah. the second market that most listens to this podcast is Australia. Uh, so 
there, I don't know if it's the Curtis Mead effect, but yeah. there's something definitely in the water, man. So I, I'm sure that they're all going to be very happy to, to, to hear this interview. Um, Kevin, should we finish this off with some rapid fire for Curtis Mead? Yeah, go for it, Ulysses. Take it away. Okay. Uh, last time you talked about food, so I'm going to put you on the spot here, Curtis. Can you cook schnitzel? Yes. Favorite movie? Jules. Ooh, good throwback pick. Oh, um, beer or wine? Beer. When was the last time you went to a baseball game as a fan? Ooh. Uh, 2018. Do you remember who was playing and where you were? It was in Houston, and I don't know who was playing the Astros. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Kevin? My only rapid-fire question is, Curtis, what is the biggest cultural difference between Australia and the U.S.? Uh, probably the fact that we speak the same language, but some words and slang that we have people in america have no idea Ooh. what what Ooh. i'm trying to say okay okay um any chance you can teach us some australian slang so we can look cool with the australian listeners and and subscribers on youtube that we have from that country so i've said a few things to like my agents and other friends like i said have a happy birthday have a ripper of a day so we would say describe a day as a ripper or like a have a crack a day or something like okay. that and like that. The americans go oh oh yeah i'll try and have a ripper and they're not <laughs> and they're not really sure about it and then like we say uh if you like something like oh are you keen on that like are you we describe yeah so we'll say okay things. So ripper probably, and keen that's great yeah. follow yeah. up on that before and curtis you've been great this entire interview what do you consider to be like an odd cultural thing that the U S does or a, or a saying of theirs that you just don't understand as an Australian native, uh, maybe a behavior thing or a language thing, whatever it may be. Uh, um, well, the easy one that was really hard to get used to was driving on the wrong side of the road. Hmm. <laughs> um, Fair enough. I'm trying to think of another one. That's a good question. Uh, or the the way that they eat food or whatever. I mean, I don't know. You you encounter, you know, American players all the time. Probably one of the weirder things was in Australia, we don't really have many chains, like food chains. Like we mm -hmm. only have a very select, maybe three or four. Everything mm -hmm. is locally owned and locally run. So the amount of chain restaurants here, you know, some are awesome. But yeah, that was totally new. I was like, oh, this that cheesecake factory is awesome. And then you're like, oh, there's another one there. And every place we go, there's a cheesecake factory. I'm like, oh, like that wasn't just the local, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. M M Mr. Cheesecake did not just put up a one. I have uh, another one. What was the favorite, what was your favorite part about the Futures game at Dodger Stadium? Uh, two things. The crowd was awesome. You know, I'd never played in front of that many people and just how loud it was, was incredible. And then all the gear we received as being part of the game was pretty cool mm. to, be, to be kitted out from all the different companies and stuff was, was awesome. Well, hopefully this year, Curtis, you're not playing in the futures game. You're playing in the all-star game, <laughs> the all-star game. That'd be something, right? So that's right. Yeah. Um, Curtis, yeah. you've been awesome. We appreciate the time and good luck at spring training and in this upcoming season as well. No worries. Thanks for having me again, guys. Appreciate it.